Today, we're diving into one of the most iconic companies in the world, Apple. With its status as the world's most valuable company in the world, the question remains, should you invest in Apple stock right now? First up, let's take a look at Apple's extremely large business. In the 12 months leading to July 2023, Apple has managed to bring $384 billion in revenue. Its revenue came from selling of physical product lineups such as iPhones, a whole bunch of Macs including MacBook, iMac, Mac Mini, Mac Studio and Mac Pro, iPads and wearables and home accessories such as AirPods, Apple TV, Apple Watch and Beats products. Aside from physical products, Apple digital services like advertising, Apple Care, cloud services, digital content mainly from Apple Store and other subscriptions such as Apple Arcade, Apple Fitness Plus, Apple Music and Apple News, and payment services including Apple Card and Apple Pay, also contributed to $380 billion in revenue. More than half of this revenue came from iPhones last year, followed by services that made up around 21.5% of their total sales. Macs and iPads each covered 7.5% and wearables and home accessories accounted for 10.5% of the pie. Among all the categories, Apple's digital services were the only segment growing year over year, now earning the second largest portion of the company's revenue at $21 billion. This has allowed Apple to lean less on selling physical products during uncertain times, especially since digital business has doubled the gross margin of physical products. Now let's see where this revenue actually came from geographically last year. Approximately 42% of Apple's sales originated from the United States, with Europe contributing 24.5% and China making up 19.5% of the pie. Now let's look at a couple of risk factors that many US companies, including Apple, faced last year. The first risk revolves around the fluctuation of foreign currencies relative to the US dollar. When foreign currencies weaken against the US dollar, it can have a negative impact on the value of Apple's foreign currency denominated sales and earnings. This situation typically leads to company to consider raising international pricing, which could potentially reduce demand for their products. To mitigate this risk, Apple might engage in foreign currency forwards and option contracts to protect itself against the foreign exchange fluctuations. Another risk stems from macroeconomic conditions, which include factors like inflation, a slower economic growth, or even a recession, along with higher interest rates. These conditions can negatively affect consumer confidence and therefore spending, ultimately reducing the demand for Apple's products. Additionally, these macroeconomic conditions have had a negative impact on Apple's investment portfolio, resulting in around $12 billion in unrealized losses from their securities due to the recent interest rate increases. On the positive note though, it does provide Apple with a higher interest earnings on its cash holdings. Alright, now let's dive into financials. First thing first, Apple is currently trading at around $170 per share, bringing the total market cap to $2.66 trillion. A quick comparison of Apple's stock performance over the past 5 years against some key indices. Apple has not just held its value but outperformed them by a significant margin. If you had invested 100 bucks in Apple 5 years ago, it would have turned into $411, translating to an impressive 300% gain by September last year. In contrast, the S&P 500 would have given you only a 50% profit over the same period. Taking a closer look at Apple's financial statement, we find that they have around $28 billion in cash along with $138 billion in investments. On the other side, they have $7 billion in short-term debt and $98 billion in long-term debt. Crunching the numbers and the enterprise value comes out to be $2.611 trillion. Over the past 12 months, Apple has generated a staggering $384 billion in revenue. After subtracting all the expenses, they're left with around $95 billion in net income. Additionally, Apple generated around $101 billion in free cash flow. Think of it as the money that would end up in your pocket if you own the company. It's the portion of the cash flow that is not needed for operating the company or reinvesting. 
As for earning per share, it stands at $5.95. In simple terms, if you owned one share of Apple, $5.95 is your share of the 95 billion net income. With these numbers, Apple is trading at 6.7 times its revenue, 29 times its earning, and 26 times its free cash flow. This valuation is higher than Apple's historical 10-year average of around 20. A higher valuation, all else being equal, reduces the potential for a higher return in the future. To be completely fair, Apple has shown to us its ability to grow earnings faster than sales thanks in part to their high margin service segment. But with a PE of 30, it still requires a fair amount of optimism. Now let's talk about growth. Apple reported a negative 1.4% growth in the last quarterly report, making it the third consecutive quarter of negative growth this year. Predictably, investors weren't really thrilled with this news, leading to a 13% decline in Apple's stock price since the end of July. However, over the long term, Apple has managed to achieve impressive growth given its size, with revenue growing at an annual rate of around 8.7%, free cash flow at approximately 14.5%, and net income at around 11% over the past decade. Additionally, the stock price has risen by more than 25% each year over the same period. If we assume that Apple maintains the same growth rate, by 2033, Apple could be looking at $886 billion in revenue, $374 billion in free cash flow, and $269 billion in net income. With an average P.E. ratio of around 20 for Apple stock over the past 10 years, the stock could potentially reach $336, providing an estimate 7% return annually for the next decade, including dividends that's more like 8% a year. Now let's take a closer look at the balance sheet to assess the company's financial health. First off, let's consider liquidity, which measures how quickly Apple can cover its current liability. If we take the current assets, which are essentially assets expected to be converted to cash within the next 12 months, we can also take into account the securities that Apple has that have a maturity of over one year, which make them a non-current asset, but since there is an active market for bonds, they can be converted to cash if they had to pretty easily. Now if we divide them by current liabilities, or the liability that needs to be paid within the next year, we get 1.66. So clearly there isn't any liquidity issue here. Apple has one and a half times more current assets than current liabilities. However, there is one number that may raise some eyebrows. Retained earnings for 2022, which is negative. Diving deeper, we find that Apple spent roughly $118 billion last year on dividends and stock to purchase programs explaining the dip in return earnings. Now let's consider the debt ratio, which reveals how much of Apple's assets are financed with debt. Ideally, the lower the ratio, the better. Apple has $302 billion in liabilities and $352 billion in assets, resulting in a ratio of 0.85, meaning that 85% of assets are financed with debt, a relatively high number. If we take a closer look into the earnings report on the debt section, we notice that they primarily use the money from their commercial paper for dividends and stock repurchase programs with an interest rate of 2.31%. As for long-term debt, the majority consists of fixed rate notes, with interest rates ranging from 0.03% to 4.78%. To ease concerns about substantial debt, let's see how quickly they can pay it back using their net income. We can do that by dividing the net income from the income statement by the long-term debt that Apple has. If we do that, we get 1.01, .01, indicating that with just one year of net income, they can clear all long-term liabilities. A very comfortable position to be in. In the balance sheet details, we spot around 5 billion worth of inventories. If we divide the inventory by the cost of sales, which amounts to 201 billion, considering only physical products, since we can only have physical products in our inventory, we get 0 0.0245. When we multiply this by 365, it translates to approximately 9 days, 
This number represents the number of days it takes from when Apple purchases raw materials to when they finish production of products and sell it to customer. Its remarkable efficiency, especially if you compare it to its competitors like Samsung, which take over 100 days. Now let's focus on account receivable, the money owed to Apple by its customer, totaling around $28 billion. Dividing it by total net sales of $394 billion, and that gives us 0.071. When we multiply this by 365 again, we get 26. So it means that it takes Apple less than a month to collect its money owed by its customers. Comparing it to Samsung, which is around 51 days, Apple is doing pretty okay. And similarly, if we do the same exercise for account payables or the money that Apple owes its supplier and divide the amount payable by the cost of sales and multiply it by 365, we get 105. This means that Apple takes more than three months to pay its supplier. So technically, Apple has enough time to create products, sell them, and collect its receivable before settling its payable to customers. In summary, if we take the 9 days from inventory days, add receivable days, and deduct the payable days, we get negative 70. This is an insanely good number. It is not only low, it is negative by 70 days. Essentially, from the moment Apple generates cash from its inventory, they have a comfortable 70 days until their payments to their suppliers are due. Now let's address the elephant in the room, Apple's premium valuation. Frankly, it is hard to justify. Apart from the recent revenue decline, Apple's business is in a very mature stage of its life cycle. Unless there is a game-changing product on the horizon, it's hard to envision double-digit revenue growth in the coming years. Additionally, among other things, you must pay attention to the success of Apple Pay. Since its introduction in 2014, it has become the second largest digital wallet among the top 1500 retailers in North America and Europe, trailing only behind PayPal, which was founded 25 years ago. So that concludes our in-depth exploration of Apple's business and their financial. I hope you found this video enjoyable and informative.